Welcome back to Switched to Linux. Well, today we're going to have a look at a brand new Linux distribution that the very first version was just released about a month ago. And we're going to have a look at what this distribution is, how it works, how it functions, and things like that. We're going to shift up the format in this video a little bit more. I had took in some extensive notes on this distribution, so I feel like we're going into it with a lot of the other things in mind. So let me know if you like this newer format, and uh, we'll keep doing these down the road. So first, what is the operating system? This is called Vanilla OS. And Vanilla OS is based on Ubuntu, but it is unlike any other basic Ubuntu system. In my opinion, they should have based this on Debian instead, uh, because there's really nothing in it. They didn't keep anything that was traditional to Ubuntu. Like, it uses the a vanilla GNOME experience rather than the Ubuntu modified GNOME. Uh, as of right now, they don't have snap packages in it, although that was in their roadmap. They just couldn't get it working for the very first release. So that will be down the road. But there's a few other different things. Basically, this operating system is radically different. They're seeking to have a full-fledged, containerized, immutable operating system. So let's talk about that word first, immutable. The immutable operating system in this instance, what we're looking at is an operating system that does not have any small point changes throughout the time. Now, the theologian geeks like myself, we see the word immutable as completely unchangeable. So when I see an immutable Linux distribution, I'm like, oh, can, how can you change the system? Well, that's not specifically what it means. What it means is that the system is not designed to be changed by single point updates. It's designed to all be completely containerized so that every element of the system works independently from every other element of the system. There are a few different ways to do this. We talked about Nix OS a couple weeks ago, where in Nix OS, that is a true immutable system. It's very difficult to change several things throughout it. And um, as we look at that particular um, distribution, even changing the host's file was completely different. We don't have that situation here in Vanilla OS, but what we do have in Vanilla OS is a way to manage the systems in a similar way as uh, you have inside of Chrome OS um, or the new Android systems. Basically, we have two parallel systems and then when you're making updates or any changes, it's going to be deployed across one of them, leaving the old one completely intact. So if there's a problem, an error, it will revert back to the old version so you do not have a problem. Now, this raises a lot of concerns. It's not the best model for security, in my opinion, because, yeah, as long as the malware doesn't fail to install, it's going to be ported across both your systems. This is not a high security methodology as much as a system makes sure your whole system doesn't come crashing down because of a faulty dependency that gets deployed across the system. That's really what our purpose is. Now, they were trying to use almost, and they almost got it working. They switched and used AB root instead. So as you look at the file system of this particular um, uh, Linux distribution, and we'll go ahead and pull this up on the, uh, on the disks uh, module over here, uh, if we look at how the partition sequences work, you can see we have uh, uh, partition one, partition two, three, four, and then look at the notes up here. File system partition one, file system partition two. We have uh, B, we have A, and then we have file system, and then there's a couple free spaces. Uh, you know, grand total of four megabytes of this disk is not being used. Now, this raises the very first issue that I have about this. This requires a massive amount of hard drive space. I am using the minimum amount, which is 50 gigabytes, and my home folder is already out of space. And I haven't done anything on the system yet other than install a few small packages because I just want to test how did their system work because as we'll get into it a bit, the way they are installing software is quite a bit different. But what we see going back to this 
disk partition, we see this A and we see this B. Each of these are 20 gigabytes. These are your file system partitions. And as we look at these, we see that A right now is not mounted and B right now is mounted as the file system. Well, if I make any system changes, what's going to happen is A is going to be the partition that is mounted on the next system. And then B is going to become a clone of system A once it successfully boots. And so we have our partition here, uh, the file system partitions, you'll see that one is mounted at boot EFI and the other is just mounted at boot. And uh, this will determine which one of your two partitions becomes your core system. Now all of your software and everything else is on your last partition, which is mounted at home. So this is what makes everything all containerized. Now they do use by default on the installation, you actually have the ability to choose flat packs, app images, or snaps with the parenthetical snap is not working right now. So as you're testing this out right this moment in time, snap is not in that option. But when you're setting up the system, you have the ability to turn on or turn off flat packs or app images. If you choose flat pack, it's going to automatically configure flat hub. And then you can use the GNOME software store to install anything in the flat hub repository. There is no easy way inside that GNOME store to install things from the Ubuntu repository. So how do we get into that? Well, this is going to be a little bit more difficult to get into it, but let's go ahead and talk about the software next. So the software, we have Flatpak app images and soon will be snaps, but everything is all isolated out into small containers. In fact, uh, they actually, and what makes Vanilla OS such an interesting thing is it cr creates a series of sus subsystems inside, kind of like Windows subsystem for Linux. This is several Linux subsystems inside of Vanilla OS. Now, uh, they actually have added two since I first set up my machine, by the way. Uh, when I first set this up, we had our Apex sub uh, managed system. We had our, our Arch Linux subsystem, which as a caveat right now does not work. And I did find similar help documentations. The Arch subsystem is not designed to pull out of the Arch repository. It's designed to pull out of the Arch user repository. So AUR. The problem is they do not have yay properly configured. I did not spend the time figuring out how to get yay properly configured with this because this is just a brief testing system. Fedora works works just fine. Uh, you use a DNS flag, uh, Alpine uh, Linux. So anything from the Alpine you can install using that. But then as I booted this up today to actually record this video, now we actually have two new ones, OpenSUSE and Void Linux. So what their idea here behind Vanilla is they are adding in all these so that if the Vin Void OS or OpenSUSE has uh, individual packages and you want the versions from those instead of maybe the versions out of Ubuntu, you can use these and then it installs the packages containerized for your system. And you can see I have installed applications. I have FileZilla, which is uh, Apex Manage. So that's just your basic Ubuntu. Bluefish came from Apex. And you'll see that I installed Bible Time based on the Fedora subsystem. So uh, when I go ahead and click that, you'll see that it will boot up. Of course, I didn't actually configure anything, but you know, it boots up first boot. And if I pull up my uh, system keys here, it is here, although it didn't give me the icon. Uh, maybe that's a bug and whatever else. You'll see FileZilla works, Bluefish Editor works. I did have actually a few issues with FileZilla initially where it was not able to um, read the cache file. Um, I get resolved that just by deleting the old cache files and let itself re rebuild itself. But the idea here is that you can use a variety of different applications from a variety of different Linux distributions, and then you can pull up the software and whether it comes out of the, the um, repositories for the Linux distros or the app images or the flat packs, it's all going to work inside of the same system. So this is that immutable containerized system. Each application in behaves completely independent. And each time you're installing a new app, application through the subsystem, it creates a container for that specific application. Now, the downside is for anybody who is new to Linux, this is probably not something you want to uh, necessarily um, start with unless you're into a little bit of a challenge because you don't use, um, you don't use your typical package managers, you use Apex. 
APX. And then if you just do APEX install and find some application you want to install, so let's say like Audacity, then it should hunt for this. And this is actually going to be from the Ubuntu repository. I'm gonna say no, I don't wanna download 200 megabytes of information, but that's how to install something on your basic repository. Now, there is also um, Apex, and then if you do a DNF flag, this is going to pull it out of the uh, out of the Fedora repository. So uh, let's go ahead and do uh, Apex DNF install. I'm actually going to do VLC, which may fail because VLC is not in the Fedora repository unless you enable your extra repository. So this may not find something. So you see it finds, oh, we did not find a match. Uh, let's see if Audacity is in that one. That one I don't know. Oh, of course, I do need to spell Audacity correct, so let's go ahead and spell it correctly this time. And let's see if it finds it. So there you have it. We do actually have, uh, we could download uh, 46 megabytes, and uh, it's going to download just a lot of uh, small software packages. Uh, we're not going to go ahead and install it right now, just, just so you can see how you install it. And then, of course, uh, there is the uh, APK gets you your Alpine and the OpenSUSE and the Void Linux just showed up today. I'm sure they'll tell us soon what flag you need to use to get to those. Uh, who knows? Maybe flag flag void or <laughs> Zipper, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, that is actually how you're installing software. And then it's going to uh, go ahead and install your software based on that. Now, I did actually, before that worked, I had to come in here and I had to click on each of these buttons over here in order to get those set up the first time. I'm not sure if that was just, I wasn't sure exactly what I was doing, but I did notice when I first got in there, booted up the command line, typed in the APX. It's like, I don't know, no, no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> And so once I click the buttons over here to create the containers, now they're into the system. And so that is going to work. Now the updates, since we're in here, we do have the ability to check for updates. And then we have smart updates. We'll only update if the system is not under high load and does not have a low battery. And then there's auto update. Uh, we'll have updates will automatically um, update themselves in the background. And that's probably why I ended up with those new subsystems that I haven't seen before. Let's go ahead and pull up the software store here. This is telling me we have updates. I'm thinking this is software updates, not core updates. But if I go ahead and look into these, every single thing inside of this repository is going to be from FlatHub. So there's nothing in here from the basic repository. So you're going to be installing your non-flatpak software through the terminal at this point in time, which is fine, but it creates the containers for each one of them. All right, so um, talking about the installer, um, of course, maybe I should have talked about that earlier, but um, I'm walking through a checklist here. So the installer is a custom installer. When you set it up, you choose the software packages you want based upon the software repositories you selected. So by default, it's going to install just the basic GNOME applications and a vanilla GNOME. And then you have the option to choose Flatpak, app image and in the future you'll have the ability to choose snap packages your next screen is going to take you to the software you'd like to install and then you can choose a variety of software so that on your first load it's going to do that and then it's going to add all of the extra things that uh, you might want so other than uh, other than those this is certainly uh, minimal Let's get into my basic considerations. Um, and we've already touched on a few of these, but just so you understand, the first massive, massive disk space needed. Their minimum is 50 megabytes and they need to change that. They should say 75 because at 50, uh, 50 gigabytes, I have a 20 gigabyte system A, a 20 gigabyte system B, I have an eight gigabyte home directory. And since all of the applications are containerized, that home directory fills up completely, really fast. And without even installing more than just a few packages, I was getting constant memory low warnings inside of my 
uh, my GNOME shell notifications. I went in there and removed a bunch of GNOME applications <laughs> is what I did so that you didn't get those popping up on this. But it does require massive disk spaces. Um, that minimum amount of 50 is not enough. Now, this might have been a concern maybe a, a couple years ago as hard drives got really big, but people switched to SSDs and SSDs were small and more expensive. Now we're getting to the point where a good size SSD is, uh, is affordable again. And so I don't think it's as big of a concern today, but if you're trying to run this on a virtual machine, literally the computer I'm running this on, it has a 256 gigabyte um, uh, 256 gigabyte SSD in it. So literally a 20% a of my current computer's disk space is being used up with this virtual machine. So not one you probably want to uh, virtualize unless it's just learning how to use it, but it's pretty good. Uh, and we did already talk about the updates. So that is my look at vanilla OS. It is definitely, definitely cool and intriguing and fascinating, I gotta say. The downsides, I'm not a huge fan of GNOME personally, so it's probably not what I'm going to use. I also, I don't really care as much about the immutable system in my desktop environment. Uh, on a server, immutability makes a little bit uh, more sense sometimes. In a desktop, I don't know if it makes as much a deal. I could be wrong about that. That's for you guys to decide for yourselves. But nevertheless, this system is really cool. I do like it. I love the direction where it's going. I'm going to keep an eye on it. Is it going to be a daily drive? of mine? Probably not. Um, I don't care about immutability in my core system like this. And um, there's enough in here that eh, I don't like using flat packs unless it's a last resort. I want to use the repository software, things like that. Those are all my personal choices. This is a cool system to check out. This is only been out for about a month. There are still some known bugs in it. So just be aware of that. They do give us warnings, you know, probably not the thing to stake your entire full-fledged production system on, but it is a really cool idea. I love the way they're doing it. I love what they're doing. I love they're adding new con uh, containers, and I love how, uh, how um, motivated they are to get us something different, unique, into the desktop world because this is a fascinating distro. You should check it out, uh, particularly if you got VMs and you like looking at new things because this is completely different from a lot of the boring distros we've seen in the past. Uh, before we wrap up, let me jump back over into the system though. And uh, what we're going to do here is I wanna have a brief look at what the kernel is and I wanna see if we can see what our uh, system resources are. Let's see, do we have an activity monitor? We do have a system monitor. So uh, this system is running at 1.5 gigs. I've given it three gig, uh, I've given it six gigs, excuse me, out of my uh, system memory and uh, processes are not doing uh, too bad. I have not noticed in all my early testing, I've not noticed if uh, there's any, um, uh, any lag, anything like that. It's a very responsive system. I can say it, it is, it runs smooth uh, on a VM, which is really good. Uh, it looks like we have 519 cur uh, Linux kernel. So those are the, the basic little things I like to show everybody. Um, really cool. You should check it out. I'll link the uh, website where you can download it for yourself uh, down below. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a look over on the website, switch to linux.com, all the social media. Of course, we have a new um, Matrix community down there. Hopefully, you can find that. Uh, if it's not publicly listed, it will be linked. Uh, it is linked on the bottom of the website. And uh, with that, we have uh, several other uh, support channels. You can help support the channel over there. Thanks for watching, everybody. And I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.